Hi everyone, today we'll be talking about common conditions uh, that come out in the Station 5 exam, um, especially in the Singaporean uh, basis context. So the purpose of uh, going through these conditions is not really to focus on the details of each condition, uh, but instead to uh, flesh out how these conditions actually uh, come out specifically in the Station 5 exam. Um, I think uh, one of the key take home messages is uh, to realize the importance of um, suspecting and being able to identify the underlying condition um, early on in the station five exam uh, for a classic station five case. So in doing so, uh, we'll also be showing some pictures that uh, were obtained from Google search. So, once again, going back to what comes out commonly, uh, this is a quick fill of uh, the common conditions that came out in Station 5 uh, over the recent years, looking back at the records uh, that were shared. Um, so as you can see, endocrinopathies as well as rheumatological disorders uh, feature uh, very heavily in the Station 5 exam. So we're actually today we're going through the um, commonest conditions. Uh, so Gray's acromegaly, psoriasis, systemic sclerosis, and ankylosing spondylitis, which probably accounts for a good maybe uh, 50 to 60% of the Station 5 cases. So I would say if you were to put your, your money on this, um, it would probably be worthwhile spending some time uh, knowing these conditions well and thinking through how they actually come out in the Station 5 exam. So let's talk about uh, Gray's disease first. So most of us would be familiar with how Gray's disease can manifest in terms of the um, symptoms of thyrotoxicosis. Uh, but oftentimes in the uh, PACES exam, Station 5 case, uh, it may not be so straightforward. So I think a framework to think about it is um, the presenting complaint that is given in the STEM can either be a presenting complaint relating to the disease itself. It can relate to a complication of the disease. Uh, it could relate to uh, medication-related complications. So what I mean by this, so a patient can present with, let's say, neck swelling, and this is directly due to uh, Graves' disease in itself. A patient may present with uh, soft throat or may be referred from the GP for um, some blood test abnormality, namely leukopenia, and this could be due to agranulocytosis uh, from the medication uh, that's given to the patient. Uh, the patient may present with lower limb weakness, um, due to periodic paralysis, and this can be seen as either an association or a complication of Graves' disease. So it's important to be able to think laterally in the Station 5 uh, exam because uh, the presenting symptom may not necessarily just be due to the disease in itself, but also due to its associations, its complications, and medication-related complications. So symptoms of Graves' disease, um, I think most of us will be pretty familiar with it. Associations-wise, um, other... Uh, autoimmune disorders, but in particular, hypochromic periodic paralysis is something important to think about. Um, in terms of the physical examination findings, uh, I think most of us are familiar with the thyroid exam, uh, beginning with the peripheries, um, eye signs will be very important uh, in examining the neck uh, for either a goiter or a scar, uh, as patients uh, may have had Graves' disease with previous surgery, previous video iodine therapy, um, and uh, at present state may uh, either be hyper or hypothyroid depending on the success of treatment. Um, in terms of the treatment, I will not go into too much details, uh, but from the pharmacological point of view, thionamides remain the mainstay and normally carbimazole is the first choice because of the reduced hepatotoxicity. Um, there are some considerations in pregnancy which you can read about. Um, next lines of treatment will include radioactive iodine uh, as well as surgery. Um, however, uh, of note, the radioactive iodine can worsen thyroid eye disease. So in a patient with uh, thyroid eye disease, this may not be a treatment option that you want to offer up front. Uh, the options for eye disease treatment uh, are elucidated here. And um, as mentioned, hypokalemic periodic paralysis is one of the um, conditions that can uh, appear in the Station 5 exam in the background of thyroid disease. So the treatment uh, is uh, mentioned here. So next, uh, we move on to the next condition uh, of acromegaly. So once again, uh, we think of it, we can think of it in terms of the uh, disease itself. 
So it could be an approach, let's say, to uh, someone who notices a change in the appearance of himself. But usually it's not that straightforward. Uh, so a patient may present with OSA, or sorry, may present with, let's say, headache. Uh, so headache can be due to various things. It could be due to a complication of obstructive sleep apnea or direct mass effects uh, from, let's say, the tumor or perhaps uh, even uh, poorly controlled hypertension. Um, the patient may uh, present with uh, GI bleeding and we know that diverticular disease and GI malignancies are associated with acromegaly. The patient may present with uh, hand numbness due to carpal tunnel syndrome that's associated with acromegaly. So as, as you can see, it's important to um, think of uh, different approaches uh, where they may relate to either the condition itself, its associations and complications, uh, or treatment that uh, can then be tied back to suspecting the diagnosis. So when, when at this point in time, I would like to uh, make a suggestion. And the suggestion is that uh, when you study, um, so of course you study your approaches uh, from a top-down uh, approach, but when you study your conditions also, it's when we think bottom-up and we start linking them to different approaches. So when you see a patient, let's say, with a uh, headache, and if you can make that link to, let's say, um, knowing that OSA is something to, to think about in your headache differential, then when you step into the exam uh, room, it's important to think of things that you can actually inspect for. And if, let's say, acromegaly was one of the things that you can think of in your differential list and you uh, observe features suggestive as such, that would be very helpful because uh, then you can perhaps reverse engineer uh, the uh, history taking process. But of course, it's also important to maintain a rational, a rational and systematic approach. So in terms of features of acromegaly, um, I think these are well explained in the books and this is a a good summary of things. Uh, a lot of it is the uh, facial features, the enlarged uh, hands and feet, uh, as well as some of the uh, systemic organs being involved. Investigations wise, uh, just a quick run through. Beginning, you begin your scre screening with insulin like growth factor one, and uh, it is confirmed by looking for non suppression. Uh, of a of growth hormone when an oral glucose tolerance test is performed. The MRI pituitary is to uh, localize the lesion and you send off uh, other hormonal screens. And you can screen for complications such as obstructive sleep apnea, metabolic conditions uh, as well. Um, Treatment-wise can be considered into surgery, radiotherapy, and medication, although surgery is usually the mainstay. So these are um, just some pictures that were obtained from a Google image search. As you can see, the very uh, prominent facial features uh, that were described, uh, looking to the mouth, also for macroglossia, uh, increased interdental spacing. Um, these are the enlarged hands. Uh, these are skin tags that represent active disease. And this is acanthosis, nigricans, that can be associated with acromegaly as well. So next we move on to psoriasis. Psoriasis is usually fairly straightforward in the station five exam. Um, it's usually, if it's extremely straightforward, you'll be someone who comes in with uh, joint pain. But don't forget that the arthropathy in psoriasis can be of different patterns. So patient may come in with back pain, hip pain, hand pain, uh, or even enthesitis. Um, Another possible approach would be an approach to a rash, uh, and thirdly, um, possibly there are shortness of breath, uh, where the main systemic complication would be that of uh, interstitial lung disease. For psoriasis, it's important to consider triggers. Um, so uh, sometimes it can be someone who comes in with a flare, and the purpose of the station five, um, perhaps more of the UK style, uh, may be focusing on elucidating the underlying trigger. HIV infection is an important cause uh, for a fulminant flare of psoriasis. Uh, medications, steroid withdrawal, certain medication listed here can be triggers for psoriasis as well. Um, clinical features wise, um, I'll not belabor them, but these are described here in this slide. Uh, important to examine the nose too, and uh, as we kept different joint involvement patterns. 
Uh, investigations by psoriasis is by and large a clinical diagnosis, although supportive radiological investigations uh, may be suggestive. Um, a chest radiograph uh, would be a suitable initial investigation looking for interstitial lung disease. And management wise, it's stated here, but of note, generally systemic steroids are avoided. So, this is a typical salmon pink scaly uh, psoriatic rash. Uh, this is a pretty extensive rash, so it's important to uh, examine the skin thoroughly in a patient with suspected psoriasis. So sometimes patients may have their skin pretty well covered, uh, and um, so someone with joint pains, if you do not get them to expose themselves adequately, you might miss the rash. So these are the new findings. Okay, next, uh, systemic sclerosis. So this is once again one of the conditions that come out quite frequently in uh, the PACER Station 5. And it's one of those conditions that actually um, has quite a bit of variability in terms of how it comes out. And therefore, it's actually a pretty nice Station 5 because they have nice signs and also um, nice clinical scenarios. So um, one would be uh, shortness of breath, in particular, it could be someone uh, with uh, interstitial lung disease. Uh, when someone has interstitial lung disease in the context of a uh, rheumatological autoimmune disorder, it's important to think about underlying disease as well as medication that the patient is on. Uh, the shortness of breath could also be contributed and worsened by pulmonary hypertension that can be independent of interstitial lung disease sometimes. Uh, systemic sclerosis can also feature with a patient coming in with dysphagia because of esophageal dysmotility. Uh, there can be hand pain, hand, discom hand discomfort, hand discoloration noted in Raynaud's, uh, or it could be someone being referred to for poorly controlled hypertension, uh, or let's say um, frothy urine because of a uh, scleroderma renal crisis presenting with proteinuria. Um, so clinical features, uh, it is important to distinguish whether it's limited or diffused uh, and the examination findings are predominantly found in the face, uh, in the hands, and looking at the uh, lungs, abdomen for any systemic complications. Um, in terms of diagnosis, once again, uh, I think for systemic sclerosis, oftentimes people may get lost in the discussion pertaining to the serology, but I think upfront it is important to state that systemic sclerosis is largely a clinical diagnosis, and the antibodies are mainly for prognostication uh, and classification purposes. Um, so these are the different antibodies that can be sent off with their associations. Uh, and they, they do lend a uh, supportive role to the diagnosis, but by and large, it is clinical. Um, the other investigations would then be targeted at looking for complications. So for systemic sclerosis, it's important to think of the various key systems. So GI-wise, for swallowing uh, small intestinal bacterial uh, overgrowth, SIBO, so they can get GI symptoms. Uh, at the same time, the lungs will be the next organ where they can get interstitial lung disease or pulmonary hypertension. And third would be the kidneys. And of course, not to forget Raynaud's. So when you think of these complications, then you link back to the way they can present and think about how these uh, approaches or these um, symptoms may be presenting complaint in your station 5 case vignette or scenario. Treatment-wise, um, by and large, it is targeted at the complication that has resulted. Um, steroids are generally not given. They can precipitate a renal crisis. Um, and uh, in particular, for scleroderma renal crisis, the mainstay would be that of uh, ACE inhibitors or ARPs. The rest of the treatment is uh, listed here. So this is a woman with systemic sclerosis. You can see uh, there's a pinched nose with a decreased uh, mouth opening, very tight skin, uh, salt and pepper appearance uh, over the uh, truncal neck region. And uh, this is sclerodectomy. Uh, that you see here. Okay, now we talk about ankylosing spondylitis. Um, so this often uh, comes out in station five as either an approach to back pain or perhaps related complications. Um, and once in a while, uh, perhaps less likely uh, could be medication related. Um, in terms of the disease itself, it's usually the, the joint manifestations. Uh, but don't forget the uh, extra-articular uh, manifestations of the, of the disease. 
um, Angspawn itself uh, can overlap quite closely with the uh, other um, seronegative spondyloarthropathies. So uh, psoriasis may actually present with a very Angspawn-like picture. Uh, likewise with uh, IBD-associated uh, atropathies or reactive arthritis as well. So clinical features are listed here. I think for Angspawn, it is uh, important to think through what are the critical examination steps that you want to do. Um, some people may choose to do everything, uh, but in someone with an overt reduction of movement uh, in the various planes, um, you may want to be a bit more focused. So apart from your general description, uh, then next would be demonstration of restricted uh, range of movement over your cervical as well as your uh, lumbar vertebrae in the various axes. You may want to pick one or two uh, special tests such as a uh, Schober's test and a Faber's test uh, and perhaps the occipital wall distance. Um, I think also what's important uh, yeah, so I think those would be the, some of the key features to, to look out for. Uh, yeah, I think chest, chest expansion is something that is important. So because uh, these patients can get restrictive lung disease, so it's important to actually uh, comment about the chest expansion. So in terms of extra-articular manifestations, I remember it with the 7A, so anterior uveitis starting from the top the eyes, lentil excess subluxation, apical fibrosis, aortic regurgitation, AP node dysfunction, amyloidosis, and Achilles tendonitis. So if we go through each of it, I mean, anterior neuritis could be a red eye. That's not that common for places. Station 5, fibrosis can be shortness of breath. Uh, aortic regurgitation could be shortness of breath as well, uh, or some form of uh, cardiac symptoms. AP node dysfunction could be someone presenting with, let's say, syncope. Uh, as, as a presenting complaint. So, or amyloidosis could be someone with uh, perhaps a um, nephrotic syndrome like picture. Uh, investigations wise, uh, imaging, uh, laboratory serology, uh, as well as uh, complication directed investigations, and management wise um, would be uh, multidisciplinary. Uh, with acute plasma being managed by NSAIDs, and biologics wise, it's mainly your TNF alpha inhibitors. Uh, like uh, Etanacep, Adalimumab, and Dixamab. So we've come to the end of uh, these sets of uh, common conditions. I think the few uh, take-home messages would be, uh, number one, uh, knowing what's common and focusing on these conditions. Uh, number two, remembering that uh, the presenting complaint pertaining to that condition cannot just be from that condition itself, but also from its complications and associations, as well as treatment complications, just like in agranulocytosis uh, in the context of Graves disease. Um, the third thing would be to then piece your approaches, uh, both from a top-down and bottom-up approach, and train yourself to um, start inspecting once you uh, step into the room. And in order to do so, you need to ask yourself, what are you inspecting for? And what are the conditions that would have florid signs that can be identified upon stepping into the room? So, um, yeah, so I think this sums things up. Uh, these uh, couple of conditions that have been discussed today have thus far come out pretty frequently in the Singapore uh, Station 5 MRCP PACES exam. So, um, yeah, good luck in your preparation.